For me, I'd probably go GT3 Touring as the ultimate everyday supercar. What is the most exciting supercar you've ever seen or driven? First, getting in a Bugatti Veyron with my dad, it's like you're on a roller coaster. Still unlike, the experience of being in one of those is still unlike anything else. What's the worst supercar? The ones that have issues that are almost unfixable, McLarens. What's the most nickable car? Definitely a Range Rover. <laughs> <laughs> to the point where now insurers are refusing to insure them. What's the total value of the stock in this showroom? And it turned out it was 30 million. We've actually got over 100 cars in stock at the moment, and the average value is probably 150, 200 grand. How much total stock in 30 years of cars you've sold? More than 100 mil? Oh yeah, I mean 100 mil would do in a year, easily. I don't know, it's got to be over a bill. And what's the most you've ever made on a car? Hopefully the person the board is not listening. I think about three or 400 grand probably on one car. Biggest loss, I think we've lost 100 before. If you'd like to see me interview more interesting entrepreneurs and buy more cars, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel and turn the notification bell on. Tom, what's the best supercar to own? The best supercar to own, it depends on many factors. If you're talking just about driving experience, then you know, you'd, you'd, you'd do far wrong to get anything other than a Ferrari. Uh, if, you know, hypercars, you can go Pagani, Zonda. You know, that's, that's just driving and ownership because you look at investment as well. You know, you look at if you bought a Zonda 10 years ago and paid a couple of mil, it's now worth, you know, probably eight or nine mil, potentially. Wow. Uh, so it, it depends what you want from ownership. Are you looking at financials? Are you looking at the driving? Are you looking at the relationship with the car, the reliability, the, you know, are you gonna have issues? You know, because you look at McLaren, one of the best brands in terms of the driving and the performance, but we know if you're buying a McLaren, you should expect a few little niggles, a few little issues, so. Well, depends what, yeah. I've got the McLaren question. Because okay. um, I nearly bought one, mm -hmm. and my business partner was like, "Do not buy a McLaren." <laughs> so we'll come to that. But okay, so what about an everyday supercar? Is there anything that ticks all the boxes? Uh, there's, there's definitely cars that tick all the boxes. I mean, the ultimate everyday supercar. A, little, a lot of people say there's the Turbo S, 992 Turbo S. Uh, that, for me, lacks a little bit of soul. Although the new one is very, very good, um, but it's definitely something you can take anywhere, everywhere. It's a little bit understated. Um, unbelievable performance. Holds its money very well and is generally pretty reliable. For me, I'd probably go GT3 Touring as the ultimate everyday supercar. What's the difference in that and the Turbo S? So GT, it's a GT car. It's set up a little bit more aggressively. Um, you know, it's more, a little bit more track focused, but it's got no wing compared to the normal GT3, so it's understated. So if you know, you know, and you get, you know, the enthusiasts will know that's a GT3 Touring, but to the regular eye, it just looks like a normal Porsche. So you can take it everywhere, but it's just got a bit more driver focus about it than a Turbo S. Yeah. And what is the most exciting supercar you've ever seen or driven? The just most exciting? Thrill. Um, Thrill, I mean... Erection. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, be, these behind me, I mean, I remember as a kid first getting in a Bugatti Veyron with my dad, and that still to this day is probably the most thrilling, most excited I've ever been. When you go in one of these, as a kid especially, it's like you're on a roller coaster. The, as you put they're the foot down, fast, they're that they? fast. It's yeah. still unlike the experience of being in one of those is still unlike anything else. Yeah. Um, but it's also very smooth and comfortable. So, you know, there, there's other stuff that you can get more scared by because these are four-wheel drive. They're, they're pretty solid on the road. You can get in something like a P1, a McLaren P1. They're a lot hairier. They're, you're right on a Twitchy. knife edge. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that's thrilling in its own way. But yeah, a little bit scary. I'd prefer to be in one of these, I think. Yeah. What about the F40? I mean, that's my all-time favourite car, like classic car. Mm -hmm. um, they're, I guess they're quite... Um... Yeah, it's, it's, you know what, it's been a while since I've been in one. Um, you know, they are the poster car. They are so many people's all-time favourite yeah. car. Um, but yeah, haven't, haven't driven one in a long time. Again, I've been in one when I was a kid. We don't sell 
a lot of F40s is just probably slightly too old for right. what we normally sell. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, the iconic car is, is, is yeah, the F40. Yeah. What's the worst supercar you've ever <laughs> had in the showroom or had the <laughs> disgrace of owning or driving? <laughs> the, yeah, the, the worst ones for us are ones that have issues that are almost unfixable. So we've had some cars, McLarens <laughs> normally, uh, that have a few issues and they're in McLaren waiting for parts, waiting for something to be sorted, which can be, you know, I've just had a car in McLaren for eight months. Wow. Um, and it's only just been sorted. So those for us are like, it's dead money, yeah. it's, it's stock we can't sell. Um, so in that respect, they're, they're the worst. I mean, it's not just McLaren, we've had some other cars, uh, Ferraris as well as, as the occasional problem. But, you know, most of the stuff is, is, you know, there's not anything that sort of highlights to me as a really bad supercar. The guys before I started working here, they, they tell a story of we had a Koenigsegg, one of the very, very early ones, which apparently was a nightmare. Um, you know, had a lot of problems. I think it you know, broke down a few times. I, I know that the brand has gone yeah. you know, way better now and I think I'm sure they're more reliable, but that, that's a car that a lot of people that were here before me always say, oh, don't go near a Koenigsegg, but I think that's old news now. Right. I guess when you don't make that many cars, mm. you know, if you're Volkswagen Audi group, you can put all the money into the research, the testing yeah. and all of that. I don't know how many cars Koenigsegg made back then, but yeah, no, it probably was 50 one of the, a year. Yeah, yeah, if that. So uh, it, it was probably one of their first cars. So it's you know, yeah. and any growing you know growing pains of building a brand, especially a, a car manufacturer, it's, you know, it's acceptable. Yeah. I think. Um, Have you met Christian? No, I haven't. Not, I would not love personally. to. We've yeah, been on a Christian like a von Koenigsegg <laughs> for five years. Christian, if you're watching, or if anyone knows Christian. This is one of the biggest shows in the world. You need to be on this show. <laughs> to me, he's the Elon Musk of cars. What do you think? He, he's definitely building a, a legendary status and, and the brand is getting stronger and stronger. And he seems just like a cool dude, yeah. looks like a cool yeah. dude. Uh, so yeah, get him on, get yeah. him on for sure. Yeah, okay. So um, what is the worst depreciating sports car you've ever had? Or generally um, in the brand? Worth depreciating, I guess if you look at list price, the depreciation can be huge on certain cars, but a lot of people don't pay list price. Yeah. You know, Aston Martin are notoriously bad for depreciation, but if you're buying a new Aston, or you could at least used to get a massive discount. So that right. softens the blow. McLaren were the same. Um, you know, you could get 50 grand off a 720S quite easily. But wow. if you paid the list price, you know, you're gonna shoot you know, 100 grand quite easily. Yeah. I mean, SF90s, uh, one in front of us, they were, some of them were 500, 550 grand new, and quite quickly they got down to 400. So that, for an owner, uh, you know, over 100 grand depreciation in less than a year is, was pretty bad. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's quite a few, there's, there's, you know, most of these cars do depreciate, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, it's, it's about buying it right and, and getting the right deal mm. to begin with, and that would just help with the depreciation. Yeah, well, I just bought, it's about two weeks away from being delivered, the newer model DBS, not that limited edition one, is it? Did you mm. say it's the Evolution? Uh, yeah, the Ultimate. That's uh, just ultimate. come out of DBS That's Ultimate. It. But yeah. yeah, that was the list of that spec was 303 and paid one in the one. In the 140s, I think it was. Yeah. Terrible yeah. colour, which helped. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, depreciation on the strange colours can, can yeah. be worse. Well, well, what now you can wrap it? them. Well, it's, hi it's like highlighter yellow, but okay. maybe with a bit of green mixed in. Yeah. But I just sent it down to Yanni, and for three grand, he'll wrap That's it. That's the thing. And, and strangely, we, we actually find these days, the more unique, the better. And the more weird, the better sometimes. Oh, really? A, 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 people like wacky stuff. Well, that, that Bugatti is a unique Yeah, that's weird, pretty out there. It's like a stick know. of rock, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, personalization, customization, especially if it's done at factory, right. is, can be a good thing. And, you know, what, something I've learned here is it's not all about what we like as, as people, you yeah. know, because what we like is, you know, not what's one man's trash, trash is another man's treasure. Um, you know, it's, yeah, we're not selling to us. Although, Normally, it bodes us pretty well in buying stuff we like, but right. there's definitely stuff that we're like, oh my God, it's horrible, and it sells like that. Yeah. 
So, yeah. Yeah. Who would be the perfect client? I'd probably say Floyd Mayweather. Right, as long yeah. as I don't actually, I don't like the guy, but if you see his car yeah, collection, it's yeah. insane. So he'd be a mega client. Yeah, would you take Andrew Tate as a client? I'd take him. I'd <laughs> yeah. take him. <laughs> yeah. He's banned from everywhere else, isn't he? but we'll, we'll take him. And so are these. So if you're not watching, you're listening. We're sat in um, Romans International, and Tom, who's the co-owner, um, we've got three Bugattis um, behind us. So you'd assume these would be a great investment, wouldn't you? I mean, they, what do you say, they make 50 a year? If that, I mean, the, the Veyrons are, you know, they stopped making them how long ago, probably 10 years ago, or maybe seven or eight years ago. So they don't make them anymore at all. So yeah, our Bugatti's a good investment for anyone who can afford one. Well, so far, they haven't proven to be the best investment. As I said, this one of this Tiffany uh, Grand Sport Vitesse, we sold about five years ago and we've just sold it again and there's very little difference in the value. And what's the normal price of so something like that at Aveyron? Uh, so the Vitesse is, that's a special edition which was um, a convertible and based on the Supersport which is the higher level. A, a regular Veyron, uh, this one that's just come in literally yesterday, that's going to be about 900 to 950. Um, you know, and again they cost over a million new so it's actually proven to be not a great investment, yeah. but I think long term, you know, these cars are so iconic. They've changed the game completely. They will eventually, and yeah. everything else around it has gone through the roof. You look at F40s, you look at Carrera GTs, you know, F50s gone mad, and these have sort of stayed the same. So we'd like to think that they will eventually catch up. And the, the longer sort of history goes on, I think the more special and important they, they'll become. Mm. Um, What's the most nickable car? We had, a, we had a video go wildly viral on this when we mm. asked someone else this, because it's quite shocking, but yeah, what's the most nickable car? I mean, definitely a Range Rover. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they are, you know, we, we get, not only my wife's car's been stolen twice, Range Rover Sport, Shit. Uh, but we found it both times because it had a tracker. But, you know, we count with forever talking to people that have had their Range Rover nicked. Um, London is particularly bad for it to the point where now insurers are refusing to insure them. Um, you've wow. got to have at least a ghost immobiliser or um, you know something that basically makes it harder to nick. But yeah. even then, they're you know these hackers they're always ahead of the game. Um, but yeah, Range Rovers just seem to be the most nickable, and it, it, you kind of look at Land Rover and think, surely you can come up with something. <laughs> Yeah. You know, Porsches don't really get nicked. Um, you know, McLaren so far don't seem to get nicked. Ferraris are getting worse. Like recently, they've seemed to work out how to nick Ferraris. Um, but yeah, other than that, Range Rovers are definitely the worst. And the, th the thing is, because there's so many of them, they blend in. So right. a black yeah. Range Rover Sport is the most nicked yes. car in the country. My MD just found that out. She has a black yeah. Range Rover yeah. Sport, <laughs> and she's like, I'm not, yeah. I don't want one. Yeah, wrap it yellow. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So um, back to the McLaren and the Bugatti Veyron. Do you think the reasons they either drop a lot, and the Astons, or don't go up as much as you would think, is the running and maintenance cost something to do with that? Definitely with Bugatti, you know, these cost a lot of money to service. How much? Uh, you're talking at least 20 grand, sometimes more. 20 um, grand plus just for an oil just, change? Just, just for an annual service. Um, <laughs> you know, but we've had services that cost a lot more than that. And then the tires, you meant what's to the change. Highest, what's the highest service you've ever seen on a Bugatti? I mean, we've, we've probably had, well, if you include putting a warranty and a service pack on it, you can, you're talking about can be 100, over 100 grand. For a, just, for a yearly service. Yeah, yeah we've had, because if you've got to change Shit. the tyres and the wheels. And how much are the tyres to change? Tyres are at least five grand a tyre. And you can't get like eBay no. cheaper ones. <laughs> <laughs> and each three tyre changes, you have to change the wheels. And how much are the wheels? And the wheels, I think, are 20 grand each, something like that. Um, so, so it's, a, it's the price like of a regular car per yeah. wheel. Yeah, it, it might be a bit less than that. It's been a while since we've actually gone through the rigour of having to do that. but. It's, I think, at least 10 grand a wheel. Um, so it's, it's, and that puts investors off. Yeah. Um, is it mostly investors who buy? 
to get I it. I think it is now. When it first came out, it was obviously anyone that wanted the latest, the most special thing. Now, mm. Veyron's have sort of moved into that sort of classic car status. So it is more investors, as much as they're pretty usable to drive. But now it's the Chiron that's the people that want the right. latest, uh, the latest special Bugatti. But these are now crossed over to be more of a classic investment car. And I think people are seeing them as massively undervalued now. Yeah. And you don't have to service them every year if you're going to put it away. Um, you know, you, every two years is probably fine. You, they actually, Bugatti have just brought something out where you have a collector's package uh, for servicing and a user's package for servicing. And the collector's package is a lot less because um, obviously less worried about you using it and something going wrong. Um, so, you know, Bugatti is starting to realize there's, there's ways of, you know, more people buying them. Yeah. So with things like high inflation, um, lockdown, have you seen people start to buy cars more for investment than just for general use? Yeah, there's been, uh, it's, it's happening again now. That, that sort of goes through these periods of, you know, when other things aren't so good, you know, you look at the stock market, um, crypto, things that maybe aren't performing as well, people start to look at different assets. And I feel like it's, it's happening more and more and as people see the potential you know you've seen cars go crazy in value over the last two years since lockdown especially like um you look at ferrari the ferrari market the halo cars the f40 the f50 the la ferrari you know they've gone up a million pounds in in the wow. space of you know a year year and a half um you know sometimes they move 500 grand within you know a few months so people are starting to think right and especially with the narrative of electric cars is coming in, combustion engines are being banned, all this kind of stuff, it's helping. Uh, it's, people see these cars as proper collector's items. Um, so, yeah, it's, and, and now at the moment, especially in, I think, in, in a recession, pending recession, um, these cars are starting to become their own asset class. So people, you know, people of wealth are thinking, right, I want a property portfolio, I want a stock portfolio, I want maybe a bit of crypto. And they're now thinking, I also want a car portfolio. And it's generally the higher end stuff that's going to have, you know, the most potential to increase in value. But, you know, a lot of our clients now, you know, we sold the TDF uh, last week, which... Is that the A12, is it? Uh, F12 TDF. F12, sorry, yeah. It was only done 100 miles. Wow. And the guy that owned it before, I think he paid 600 or something for it. We just sold it for close to a million. He's never driven it. He'd never actually seen the car. So um, he just bought it too as an yeah, investment? Yeah, purely as an investment. Um, a very <laughs> shrewd investment yeah. it turned out to be. And the next guy is probably going to do exactly the same. He's just bought it. He doesn't want it on the road. He'll have it. He'll have it in his garage. He'll, he can sit in it. He can look at it. Put it he in can, those, those <laughs> big bubble wrap vacuum <laughs> yeah. pack things. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a smart, it's a smart yeah. play, I think. Um, but you've got to choose the right car. You know, Ferrari's gonna be the best yeah. uh, I think but you know Porsche um, is, is not far behind Lamborghini potentially there's some out there that I think could be good investments now that the V12 is you know no longer in, yeah. in terms of pure combustion but yeah there's 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 definitely a, a moving kind of market in terms of more and more people being attracted to cars as an investment mm. so I want to ask you about some of the your tips for what might Obviously, you're mm. not giving financial advice, but, <laughs> yeah, no, no, but no. some of your tips um, in a moment. Um, what's the total value of the stock in this showroom? If, I mean, do you um, know? Do you have to guess? Uh, we, we did this exercise about uh, a couple of months ago, and it turned out it was 30 million. Wow. 30 um, million quid worth of cars in one showroom. I mean, we've got three Bugattis here, and we've actually got another one out the back. I mean, that in itself is seven or eight million. Right. Um, and then, you know, we've got, we've actually got over a hundred cars in stock at the moment. And the wow. average value is probably 150, 200 grand. So, you know, if you do the yeah. math, it's, it's quite quickly adds up. How much is your insurance you have to pay every <laughs> year on that? <laughs> Hell of a lot. <laughs> Hell of a lot, but no claims. Uh, no, it doesn't count. <laughs> yeah. yeah, go on, tell us how much. <laughs> I think it's, it's at least 15 grand a month, I think. Wow. Yeah. 180 grand a year. Yeah. What are you most scared of for the future? 
I'm definitely scared of AI. They're going to be ahead of us as a race. Yeah, they could just end us yeah. instantly. So if you'd like to be able to buy cars like this, make, manage and multiply money, I've got a gift for you. If you check the link in the comments, I have got a digital financial freedom toolkit to help you save, make and multiply your money. It's in the comments, it's completely free. Go download it now. Have you ever had any cars nicked from your showroom? Never had a car nicked, had a motorbike nicked, so right. we no longer keep motorbikes in the showroom. <laughs> Uh, but never, this place is like Fort Knox with cameras and, you know, posts and yeah. you, you, it's very hard to nick a car right. from here. Uh, but a motorbike, someone did smash through the front window and just, you can wheel it out. Yeah. So, yeah, we now keep those uh, somewhere else. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So the car investment market, um, do you think it's a major bubble because of lockdown, high inflation? Because normally, isn't it normally the case? You buy a car and you expect it to go down in value. And it seemed like everyday cars, Porsche Taycans, 911s, were major premiums on them. I think the bubble has burst in terms of those cars, the normal cars, which are never normally selling for premiums. Mm. You know, Turbo S's, you look last year, they were 40, 50 grand over lists, which is just unheard of. And lockdown and Brexit, it, cr it did mm. create the bubble for those cars. Because of the lack of supply of them. Lack of supply, yeah. conduct, semiconductor issues, you know, uh, you couldn't order one, the waiting lists were huge. Yeah. That bubble does feel like it's burst, not dramatically, but it's going down that way. But it's going back to normal. It's yeah. not like it's, you know, if, if you bought one at list, you'll still be fine. You'll still yeah. be doing very well, in fact. Um, but the collector's market is different. That's got its own beat. You know, that's, that's only, I don't think that's a bubble at all. Um, there's a chance, there's a chance that, you know, they've, they've peaked and they might correct and go back up again. But, you know, history will tell us things like the Halo Ferraris, they only go one way. By Halo, overall. you mean their... So top, that's their top level, yeah. the F40, the F50, 288 GTO, right. the Enzo, the La Ferrari. Their hyper car each yeah. year. Yeah. yeah. And, and Ferrari are very clever at building a customer base for those cars and you know it's, it's clever investors and obviously very wealthy people that can buy those. As in they make you get in a queue and earn your way up and yeah. buy four yeah. Ferraris on exactly. the journey up. Yeah so that's it you know you're <laughs> yeah. gonna lose 50 grand on one car maybe more on another car yeah. but if you get you know. Once you get one, there. Yeah once you get there you're, yeah. you're laughing. So um, is there an argument then if you want to get into this game eventually stick to a brand because the watch market same i love watches mm -hmm. and um you know some of the ap's the pateks the richard meals they've gone wild mm -hmm. and you want you want to go in and buy a rolex daytona or you know a, a nice halo patek as you call it and there can be a three to nine year waiting list on that but you're always first mm -hmm. if you've mm -hmm. bought five or ten watches on yeah it, it works in a similar way yeah. you've got you've got to play the game a lot of people don't like playing it they don't like being told what they can do with their cars um, you know we have people looking to sell the new 812 Competizione is one of the limited edition isn't that the V12s. one that's nearly a million now or that's something. over a million now that's and crazy we, yeah, I think they're like 1.3 1.4 uh, cost new five or six hundred grand yeah. and you know that car's only just come out um, but we've had three or four people agree to sell them to us um, for over a million pounds, so they're making good money. They're very yeah. happy with the price. And they basically, in their contract, they have Ford, to let uh, Ferrari... Ferrari won't let them. They're, they're, basically, they have to give it to Ferrari to say, we're allowed to try and sell the car for six weeks or something, or four weeks. And if we sell it, they get the money. If they, if they don't sell it, they're, they're not doing their job well, for one. Uh, but then they're allowed to sell them to us. But all four they've gone to Ferrari and they've sold them. So it's right. frustrating for yeah. us, but you know, they're ring, ring fencing their brand. Yeah, because if you cleanly. go and buy, you get given these nice watches and cars, and you just quickly, yeah. you flip them, they turn their nose up at that, don't they? They can some do, brands. So, some brands do. You know, they don't always find out, obviously. Mm. Um, but, you know, Range Rover actually are one of the worst, but they can't stop it. They just, there's so many Range Rovers, and the, but they've been selling for, you know, big premiums over the last year, um, but they threaten people, they, the brand threatens the dealer who, are, who have sold the car initially with fines and, you know, but they can't stop it. When you own that car, you can do what you want with it. Yeah. You know, it's Ferrari, yeah. obviously, uh, you know, some, some people 
don't care. They're just yeah. like, I don't care, you know, I'll do what they And especially when we're offering more money. They're yeah. like, well, why am I going to take 30 grand less, you know, mm. from Ferrari when I can sell it to you for 30 grand more? Yeah. You know, they'll, they'll take and, and most of the time you can rebuild a relationship pretty quickly mm. with another dealer. Or when the, when the market changes and there's yeah. a recession and they're begging and they're for begging, business yeah, again. That's the thing. Oh, come back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, if I was doing this again, because I've been a watch collector and I, I, we've got, what, seven or eight cars now. So I've been building that up. If I was being more strategic and going back to the start, I probably would do a bit more research up front and I probably would pick one brand mm. and I probably would stick to them. Um, whether it's, say, Ferrari or Audemars Piguet, because I know by now I'd be getting all the best models. Yeah. Like, there's a, a blue Audemars Piguet Royal Oak ceramic, and um, 150 new, and they immediately go for 350. Really? Yeah. Imme immediately. And I, I've had chances to buy these watches years ago at 60, 65 mm. grand. Um, you know, when you get invited to go and see them in their factory and everything else. So... Yeah, that's probably something I would mm. do different. Is watches the same again. as cars that there's no capital gains tax? Yeah. Yeah, see. Yeah. Well, at left. the moment, yeah. I mean, there's not much left the government there's have got left, to tax no. you on. But no, I mean, they're obviously, I, I guess you can't really class them as an asset, can you? They're supposed to be a depreciable. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, that's but, the, I think but of course, cars. once they class, I think the good thing about watches and cars that stops them from taxing them is most of most them go, go down, down. That's the thing. Yeah. They can't start hand picking. No, it's know. only a very select few watches mm. that go up in value. And I'm sure it's the same with cars. It's the same, yeah. But when you're dealing just those cars or just those watches, it's, it feels like we're at risk of being taxed in some way. Yeah, but I mean, if you're doing that, you're mm. running a business, aren't you? And yeah. you get your general yeah, standard yeah, business tax. But no, at the moment, as long as you're not a trading business, you're just a private collector, no. Um, what's, so if you've got, what, 30 million of stock, how long has this, how long have you, this business been going? So the business was started by my dad in 1994. I mean, he'd been in the industry for a long time before that, but Roman's years. International was started right. in 94. So have a stab at guessing how much total stock in 30 years of cars you've sold. <laughs> That is... Uh, Do you want us to come back next week? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's going to take some real database analysis. Uh, I, I More than 100 mil? Oh, yeah. I mean, 100 mil would do in a year, easily. Um, you know, it's got to be... I don't know, it's got to be over a bill? I, don't, I, don't, I have wow. no idea. I mean, a we, our turnover's 100 mil a year. Yeah. So, you know, it, didn't all, it wasn't always that, but, yeah. you know, it's, it's got to be approaching a bill, I'd say. Wow. Mm. It's a lot. How does that feel? <laughs> well, I don't know. It's, it's lottery numbers, isn't it? I guess you get a bit blasé with the numbers when you yeah. deal in these kind of cars. But, you know, for us, it's just a, a product. It's a great product, don't mm. get me wrong. But, you know, the numbers, you kind of just get, they just seem normal to me. Yeah. Well, anyone who's been in business long enough, no. I remember I'm um, speaking to Aston Merigold of um, JLS. And I said to him, you know, what's the biggest lesson you've had in the industry? And he said, a million in a million. Because you get a million, and mm. then there's tax, national insurance, your manager, your yeah. agent, blah, 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 <laughs> your wife. And yeah. so a billion isn't a billion, is it? No. no it, wouldn't it be not. nice if it was? Yeah, it would be lovely. You could just close the doors tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right, let's talk about a bit of um, top tips on maybe what you think might appreciate. So mm -hmm. I was speaking to Carl a few weeks ago. Um, and the Testarossa has sort of started to go up. But the model before it, the 355, that's even more recently gone up, the 355. And I think the model before it was the 348, and that's still quite cheap. That's like mm -hmm. in the 70s. And so Carl was like, that's the next one to go. It's got to be, if you look at the, mm. the history. So let's say someone's got a 50 grand budget. What do you think, uh, you know, maybe the next one to go is? I mean, Ferrari's always got the biggest potential, but you've got to find the model. You know, my, my knowledge of the older stuff is not great, I'd admit, because we deal mainly in the latest stuff. But, you know, the 348 was never as loved as the 355, as far as I know. Yeah. Um, so I think the model needs to be loved a bit. Right. I mean, for me, if I had 50 grand, I'd be probably looking more at uh, some of like the German muscle cars, like the C63 AMGs, uh, you know, maybe even an RS6 V10. You know, they, they don't make them anymore. The C63, they don't make a V8 anymore. The RS6, yeah. they don't make a V10. They haven't done for a long time. But those cars, right. because they are the last of something, um, 
you know, and, and so are we looking at l scarcity here then, limited supply, is that important? Uh, it's important if you can find a special edition version, right. uh, you know, like the C63 507 edition, which yeah. is much rarer. And yeah, probably more. Yeah, and yeah. will cost more anyway, so it's all relative. But, yeah. you know, I, I'd personally look at those kind of cars. Also, the maintenance costs are less, you know, so some of these older Ferraris, you know, they might go up 20 grand, but you'll, you'll spend That's that in maintenance. maintenance cost, so, yeah. you know, the older German manufacturers don't cost as much to maintain. Yeah. So I actually think, you know, fast forward 10 years, those cars won't cost you as much. They're super fun to drive. Yeah. And, you know, they're, they're sort of iconic, the last of them. So, you know, that, yeah. that would be where I'd spend my money. I mean, have you seen the price of the, those old Ford Cosworths and things like that yeah. now? Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, that is mad. I yeah. remember those, and when they, were, they were like 20 grand. Yeah, that's nuts. Yeah, so maybe that's what, what will happen to some of these uh, AMGs yeah. and stuff. But yeah, it was a bit before my time, those right. Ford Cosworths. But yeah, yeah, I regularly get reminded by people that are older than me. That yeah. <laughs> those are the ones. Yeah. Okay, 100 grand. You've got a 100 grand budget. Where, where are we putting that? 100 grand. I guess I look at sort of analog cars as well as, you know, the best potential investments. I look at now an R8 V10 manual, you know, don't make manuals anymore. The R8 is about to be completely finished as a combustion engine car. Um, so yeah, an R8 V10 manual, probably 70 or 80 grand. I think that has got potential long term, yeah. maybe, a, maybe a 997 GT3. Um, you know, those cars are, are loved, you know, they've got a proper cult following. Um, and yeah, still quite analog, look cool. By analog, you mean well, manual, no computers? Yeah, that, yeah, you know, there's so much tech in, yeah. in the new cars that, you know, those older cars from pre, you know, the, 2010. What do they call them? The widow makers. No traction, yeah, yeah, none, no ABS. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a bit scary those to drive. But yeah, um, but yeah that, 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 in that sort of bracket, yeah, yeah, I'm sticking to the sort of German theme, yeah. it seems. But. Yeah, okay. And then what? Quarter of a mil. You got a quarter of a mil. Are you putting that into two cars, one car, and um, um, which ones? I, I'd probably go with one car. I think uh, quarter of a mil. I'd even consider a McLaren on this one. Right. So McLaren 675LT. I think that is probably the best McLaren they've built so far. It's got again a real cult following. Um, they're about two between two and two fifty. I think long term they could be a very good car, but and. Aston Martin Vantage GTA, they're a bit less than 200, but last and naturally aspirated V8s, manual, again, more of that analog theme, sound unbelievable. Yeah. And again, have that proper cult following, which I think is important for mm. collectibles. If you've got a, like a bit of a community around a particular model, GTA's got a really good, strong community where all the owners chat, all the owners yeah. like know each other, they know the, all the different cars, um, you know, those cars, I think I've got good potential. Mercedes SLS is another one. Goldwing, not making another Goldwing. And they, they keep going up. Um, so there's quite, yeah, when you get to 250. Big choice there. Yeah, there's, there's some good yeah. choice. All right, and then money is no object. Um, what, what's doing the best? Money or, no object. Yeah. Then you start talking, yeah, hypercars. And that's when you can make some serious money. Um, you know, you look at Ferraris, you know, the LaFerrari for me, it's probably the best car out at the moment. It's gone from two million to three million in the space of a year. Um, but obviously, you can go further up into the proper unicorns: the McLaren F1, the the Zondas, the um, Porsche GT1s. Then you know, then you're over ten million into twenty millions and things wow. like that. But you know, that's unlikely to happen for yeah. most people. Yeah. What's the most expensive car you've ever sold? Most expensive car we've sold. Um, we've sold a lot of cars that are around three, four million because again, we don't deal in older classics. You, you rarely get the ones that are stupid money, but yeah. you know, LaFerrari Aperta's are now four, four to five million. Um, so we sell quite a few of those. We, we have sold McLaren F1, but back when they were about three million, um, there are obviously now 20 million plus. Um, but yeah, we sell, we, we're consistent with our sort yeah. of threes and fours and fives, but don't tend to get involved in those older, older stuff that go for just, you know, tens of million. Yeah. 
And if there's one car you could just stock the whole showroom with because they just sell like a dream and they have for years, what's that? Right now, it would be the LaFerrari. We sold three this year already. Wow. Um, and have more clients for them. So, yeah, right now, if I could just stock this place with laughs. You know. <laughs> laughs, that's what you <laughs> call it. Laughs, yeah. laughs and bugs. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Laughs and bugs. The bugs are a little bit harder to sell, to be honest. Like, yeah. we, we, that took us almost a year to sell. Wow. Hopefully, this one will, will go quick. And uh, that one currently is an off-market car, which I think now that one's sold, that one could. What does off-market mean in your Off-market just means it's not advertised. Right. So it's in the showroom. It's in the showroom. Yeah. It is for sale, but we're just yeah. not actively advertising. Is it advertising. a famous person who owns that then? Uh, not especially. Not especially. No, but but someone just, who doesn't want any attention. Yeah, he just, you know, sometimes you can actually get a better sale. And it's more the people that are buying them. Sometimes they like to buy them off-market. Um, they quite like knowing, you know, in their little clan, oh, I bought that car and no one knows about it. Right. Yeah, it's quite, it's a bit yeah. more special doing it that way. Yeah. And what's the most you've ever made on a car? <laughs> Hopefully the person that bought it is not listening. Well, I mean, how would they <laughs> um, know? Yeah. 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 Uh, I think about three or four hundred grand probably Shit. on one car. You is... made three to four hundred in one deal. The thing is, when you buy them, you know, when you buy them outright, you, a lot of people at this level do sell a return where you, right. you have to be the middleman. But when you actually go and spend your own money. Right. So you could have held it. For, you could have it, timed it well. It exactly. could have gone up. Or. Yeah. So, yeah, if you hold it and wait for the perfect time yeah. or wait for the perfect customer, you know, and, and a lot of time the seller doesn't have many options. If you're trying to sell a three million pound car, there's not many people with a checkbook yeah. or the brave you know, are brave enough to go and buy it. But we, we've done it multiple times and, you know, you can go and make a lot more money that way. Yeah. Um, but you've got to have the cash in the bank mm. and be able to make that decision right there and then. Yeah. I know quite a few watch dealers who got really hurt because they had a load of stock that they paid top money for when the bubble was at its peak. And then, of course, when it popped there, I left with all this mm. stock that's dropped a lot. Has that ever happened to you? It happens not as dramatic as it all drops overnight. Um, my dad will tell me in 1989, I think it was, that kind of did happen. Um, so we're experienced. When rates went really high. Yeah, I think yeah. it was that. And, and stuff did literally half in value overnight. I think he talks about an XJ220 um, that they had and it literally halved in value overnight. But yeah. Yeah. in this market, and as far as I've known, it can happen and it's happened a little bit recently in this new car premiums yeah. uh, have sort of dramatically tailed off electric cars as as kind of the whole narrative around electric cars seems to change and values kept dropping and of you, electric cars of electric yeah. cars so Porsche Taycan's we had a few and we kept reducing them and reducing them and still <laughs> reducing yeah. them trying to find buyers they've now sort of feel like they've found their level but it's more like a, a gradual kind of yeah, but you know, there's, there's a little bit of pain to have, but as long as you keep buying more stock, fresh stock. Is it stock, about turnover, keeping yeah, the volume? Yeah, you know, up. when you've got 100 cars, yeah, yeah. you can keep, keep buying. The new stuff that's fresh in will make the money. Yes, yeah. you have to pick up a couple of losses here and there, but you yeah. know, when the vast majority make money, you'll, you'll be yeah. fine. And do you have some clients that you know, you've bought and sold the same car multiple times, or you've got clients that you've bought 10 cars for, yeah. or taken from? Uh, yeah, it happens all the, all the time. We have some clients that sell us their car and a month later, they buy it back. Oh, yeah, right. They've, re they've regretted it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we, we've, we had a, an Porsche 918 Spyder. We, it was going back some years, but the guy sold it to us and I think three months later, he bought it back for quite a lot more yeah. than he sold it for. Um, but yeah, we have, a lot of people like to sell a bunch of cars, a lot of people like to sell four or five cars all in one go. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, tends to work out pretty well. Yeah. Um, you know, we can, yeah, you send five trucks, get them all, all arrived yeah. back at once. It's quite, quite, you know, those deals are good. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, there's people we, the chop and change so regularly, you know, yeah. they, they, I've got one client in particular, he probably buys a car every two weeks. <laughs> every two yeah, weeks? Literally every two weeks. He gets bored so quickly. You must quickly. love him though. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it does my head. Yeah. Not, he, he literally calls me more than my wife. But, <laughs> um, but no, he's, he's... Every two weeks? Pretty much every two weeks. He's normally got six or seven cars. He must be 
getting killed on depreciation. He does all right, actually. He does surprisingly he? does he pretty well out of it. He's pretty yeah. smart with what he buys and, and, and sells them on seller returns so he doesn't take the hits Two all the weeks. time. Um, I do yeah. know that feeling, though, when you have a certain amount of cars. Yeah, you do like, you just think, I don't need this. This is yeah. just sitting there. Yeah. What's the point? And, and I think people get, people love the process of buying something new. Oh, and yeah. they're kind of like, oh, I've bought it now. Like, yeah. the fun bit's over. Yeah. Yeah, you'd hope that the honeymoon period of a new car would last more than two weeks. <laughs> yeah, you? you'd like to think so. Yeah. Yeah, because I normally change my every day every year. I kept the mm -hmm. Turbo S for five years because it was oh, wow, so, okay. I, couldn't, I couldn't beat it. Yeah. But yeah, I know that I, I'm. I, I'm normally every year, but every mm. two weeks. Two weeks, yeah, it's mental. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a six month oh, yeah. guy. I think after six months, I get the itch yeah. to change up to something else. Well, you're best positioned <laughs> you, to do that. Yeah, well, I try and have my, I quite like having my car. Right. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, as much as I could take something home every night, it's just, you know, then you've got to connect your phone to it and then you've got to, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. you've got to ask the guys to clean it. And yeah. You know, I'd just I'd rather have my own car. Yeah. So if three to 400 is the most you've made on a car, what's the biggest loss you've taken? Biggest loss, uh, it's probably 100. I think we've lost 100 before. Um, on, on maybe a couple of times. Uh, I, think, I think my dad's had bigger losses before I was here. I think that XJT20 was, was one he goes on about. <laughs> Still, <laughs> Still, 30 yeah. years later. Because he always reminds you, oh, back in 1989, yeah. remember? <laughs> Um, so yeah, it, it's good, you know, because I'm compared to him, fairly inexperienced. Yeah. Um, so it's good to have people in the business that have been. And a lot of our salespeople have been here 20 years plus wow. as well. So yeah. it's it's a good mix of new, fresh blood and, and and old, you know, old 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 heads. Yeah. Mm. So what's the most underrated car out there that goes under the radar? That's just solid in every way. Uh, most underrated car. Um, what is underrated? Um, I, mm, let's have a look around. RSQ8? Really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, RSQ8 is, thing is, the people that got them know they rate them very highly. Um, it's 150 grand cheaper than yeah. the Urus, which is the same car. The same car, different <laughs> badge. Yeah. Um, underrated, my previous car, I think is massively underrated and undervalued, is an AMG GTR. Right. Um, track focused, I use yeah. it every day, but, and it's for a for hundred grand, 110 grand. For me, I just think they should be so much more. Yeah. And you get the, you know, you get all the looks of like, oh my God, it looks like a supercar. It drives yeah. like a supercar. It's, it's a Mercedes, but sounds amazing. Um, I feel like they should be more, yeah. more money. They stop making them as well. Um, and yeah, that's probably, you know, that's probably what I'd go yeah. for. And what about the most wildly overrated car? <laughs> What is it they say? Mutton dressed as lamb or something like that. Mutton dressed as lamb. Yeah. The most overrated car. Lambo then, SVJ? Uh, I don't know, they're pretty cool. Yeah, they're but 100 good. grand more than the yeah. Aventador. That's the thing. Plus, because I have the Aventador and yeah. well, how much it shouldn't different be. is I the mean, SVJ? I mean, an SVJ is now, yeah, 400, 450 compared well, to a normal. You couldn't put more side skirts and vents and... Yeah, it's not the prettiest <laughs> thing in the world, but... Um, Sorry, I should, I'm asking you the question. I shouldn't be answering. Yeah, <laughs> but oh, surely the Cullinan. I mean, that is the Cullinan. The thing is, when you drive the Cullinan and you're in it, you get you get it. You right. Get, I know it doesn't look to everyone's taste. And it's a lot. And of it's money. a lot of money. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in that, yeah, it shouldn't be. So you don't don't think that's overrated? You think that's alright? Um, I I get the appeal. I wouldn't have one myself. Um, but when you're in it and the smoothness of the ride and the quality of the materials, yeah. you get why it's so much money. But yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not for me. Bentegas are not really for me. Again, a similar sort of thing. I mean, the yeah. Pura Sangue, from what I'm hearing, which is the new Ferrari SUV, that could end up being the most overrated because they're 400 grand plus. They don't look great, do they? I mean, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't seen one actually in the flesh yet. And everyone, there's huge hype about them. Yeah. And the people, that, the clients that I know that have been to see it, are all pretty unimpressed, or right. quite a few of them are unimpressed. Yeah. Um, so that, that at the moment feels like it's slightly overrated, but we'll see. Yeah, right. You are only allowed to own three cars for the rest of your life. You've got a daily driver, mm -hmm. you've got your classic, and you've got your super or hyper car. What mm -hmm. are they? What are you choosing? So my hyper would be 
Zonda. The Zonda is, is my favorite car. It was, we had one in the showroom on the first day I started here and it was just, that was like, I was in love. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and they've just gone crazy in value, but still I just, I love them. That would be my hyper. My everyday car, I'd probably choose a C63 AMG. Um, I love them. They do everything, four seats, so get the kids in the back. Uh, sound amazing, look pretty cool. Um, and everything works, you know, all the tech, the sound system is good. You know, that, that for me is, is, is my perfect daily driver. And what was the other one? The classic. A classic. Uh, well, my Zonda is kind of my classic, but... Yeah, well, let's call that your hypercar. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so an, an older classic. I probably have an old Porsche. Um, I love the bad boys Porsche. Yeah. Uh, I, I like the old Targas. I've always liked the Targas, the way they look. They're kind of retro cool. Mm. Um, but yeah, maybe not the best for investment, but yeah, if I could have a cool classic, it would probably be an old Porsche. Yeah. Would you rather, or do you think it's easier to sell one Bugatti or 10 30 gram Fords? One Bugatti. But Definitely. surely there's only like 10 people in the world who buy a Bugatti. And one but of them's just... currently in house arrest in Romania. <laughs> <laughs> he is a Bugatti buyer. Uh, it's just the work involved. The work involved in selling one Bugatti can actually be pretty minimal and very enjoyable when you're selling a car like that. Yeah. Selling 10 Fords is 10 sets of photos, 10 sets of paperwork, 10 right. sets of customers to deal with, 10 sets of potential problems. You know, with one yeah. Bugatti, yeah, it's, it's one deal. And normally they're quite straightforward, the deals when you sell something like that. Right. So yeah. Do our clients ever come to you and want to pay in cash or in watches or in Bitcoin or in NFTs? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get all sorts of inquiries. Yeah, we get people asking, can I pay fully in cash? We, we can only take, I think it's 10 grand in cash that's legally. Really, yeah. So yeah, that's where you draw the line. Um, crypto, we get asked all the time. We, we don't accept crypto in the way that we don't have a Roman's crypto account, but we have a company we work with who instantly turn it into cash. So we right. know there's no risk of... Oh, so they paid to them and then they clear yeah, to you. Yeah, they convert yeah. it into cash and, and we get paid. Yeah. So yeah, we don't take the risk of... But, but, but they're still essentially buying a car in Bitcoin yeah, or crypto. Much. Yeah, pretty yeah. yeah. And then watches, watches. Yeah, we get people ask and my, dad, my dad's more of the watch guy and he knows what watches are worth. I don't really know, but he'll, take, he'll do some deals taking watches against a car for sure. Yeah. We, yeah. We're taking in like uh, random stuff as well, like horse uh, carriages and things like that. <laughs> that was cash. Yeah. <laughs> but they, they I could be worth quite a, a lot. horse for a minute. No, no, not a, a horse. Thoroughbred. Not a horse. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, the horse carriage things, which are actually can be worth like quite a, quite a lot of money. But you've got to know horse. where and how to sell them. Haven't yeah, we, we and wouldn't. And how to value them. That's the thing. We, we would always go via someone else to, to value it and they'll, they'll buy it. But yeah. we, we can sort of effectively take it in. Yeah. Do you have any celebrity clients? Any people that people would know mainstream? Lots. Can you name any? Mm, there, there must be, surely there's some that are not gonna harm you to just say who they are. There's, there's, yeah, there's lots of people over the years, like a lot of the famous car buyers who are the likes of Rod Stewart, Simon Cowell, we've, we've dealt with for a lot, lot of years. You know, a lot of footballers, you know, there's, there's a lot of musicians. It's the kind of people you'd expect. Um, but yeah, look, they, they like to be under the radar. They don't want to But surely some songs. of them don't like to be under the radar by the nature um, of their personality. The ones that I deal with, and you know, I'm talking some of the One Direction boys, some of the, they're pretty under the radar. Right. Yeah. You know, they, they don't want to be seen yeah. buying a, a flash car or, and to be fair, most of them are not actually buying flash cars. They actually like, and even the footballers now, you know, 10, 20 years ago, I think the footballers wanted the flashiest Lambo. Now they're very much, I want an SUV, I want mm. a, you know, a G-Wagon or a Range Rover. So yeah. in general, I think celebrities want to be a little bit under the radar. It's more yeah. the smaller celebrities, more the Z-listers. The influencers. Uh, the influencers, they're the coming. ones that want to be. People like me. <laughs> <laughs> up and coming, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Is there one person that's alive that's not a client of yours that you'd love to have as a client? One person that's alive. Who would be the perfect client? You know they're just going to spend masses and... Do you know what? He doesn't live in this country, but I'd probably say Floyd Mayweather. Right, as long yeah. as I don't actually, I don't like the guy, but if you see his car yeah, collection, it's yeah. insane. So he'd be a mega client. 
For sure. Yeah, would you take Andrew Tate as a client? I'd take him. I'd <laughs> yeah. take him. <laughs> yeah. He's banned from everywhere else, isn't he? But we'll, we'll take him. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, How do you sell anything to anyone? How do you sell anything to anyone? I think, uh, obviously, everyone's got their own methods of selling. It's, you know, for me, it's about creating desire. And, you know, whatever you have, if it's a, a great idea, a great product, first of all, you've got to have that. But it's then how you present it and creating that desire, whether it's how you put it on your website, whether it's how you put it on your social media, how you have it physically in the showroom, whether you're presenting an idea or a product physically, that pre presentation of that, I think, is vital uh, to selling it. So, yeah, it's creating that desire. So, like, if you're presenting a car like this, how might you do this differently than if you're presenting a Ford Fiesta, for example? Well, I think, especially when it comes to luxury products, you know, these are not things you need, these are things you want. Um, so, creating desire by perfect photos, you know, making sure the colours of the car are resonating on, on camera, um, you know, a social media post, maybe a little video, just little things to make people think, oh my God, like, I want it, I want it. And it's, it's, it's how you do it online. And then when you come down to the showroom, obviously it's got to look perfect. It's got to look absolutely, you know, unblemished and just looking pride of place in the showroom. You know, mm. we try and space everything out here so that, you know, there's space to walk around it. You can really get a, a nice feel. Um, and that's, you know, that's going to make them fall in love. Mm. Is there a scarcity element to selling cars, whereby if you've sold enough cars and they sell really quick, you find it, um, you get better sales? A scarcity element in... As in, if I want that, but I know tomorrow someone else is, might come and buy it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. We, we don't ever use that tactic unless it's actually genuine. And a lot of people think we're not being genuine when we say, look, we'll yeah. take a call on a car and, and we'll say, look, we've actually got three inquiries in this car and people think, oh, it's just yeah. a sales technique. And then the next day it's sold and they're like, what? Like, I can't believe, yeah. you know, oh, oh my God. And they're like pissed off. So it does work. Even when people know scarcity mm. works, mm. like you know how to sell, but yeah. I bet it still works on you in the, like, I'm, yeah. I'm the easiest person to sell <laughs> to in the world. It, it does work, but, you know, it's, it's... You just want to do it truthfully. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think there's... But you, you know, must have cars that come in and then literally they're gone. Yeah, like, we have. I mean, there's day. so many cars that sell before we advertise them. Yeah. So that's why we encourage people to actually inquire if they're looking for something in particular, because stuff arises and, and the prep process can be quite long. So right. if you take a car in, it might need a, a wheel refurb, it might need a touch up here, it might need a new windscreen or, or something like that. And it can be, you know, we sometimes have cars here for like a month before we put them for sale. Yeah. So actually inquiring. So we get a lot of inquiries from people that are looking for particular stuff and we sell them before we even get to advertising, it happens yeah. a lot. Who's the best salesperson you've ever seen in your life and why? <laughs> my dad is, <laughs> is up there. I mean, he so let's, has... Let's say your dad's name and give him some marketing. So, yeah, so my dad, Paul Giaconelli, he is, uh, for me, the ultimate salesman. He is the salesman. goat, is he? Yeah, he is the goat. <laughs> um, he, he can sell ice to the Eskimos. He has a natural gift of the gab. And he won't even know what he's selling a lot of the time. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? He, is I, he I'm, old school? He is, he is old school. Um, you know, I, I'm quite different in the way that I want to know everything about the car. I want to know all my facts are right. And I'll give like a truthful, honest opinion. And, and I'll, I'll talk myself out, talk customers out of deals quite often. Uh, and then I realize I've talked them out of it. But long term, they actually, they kind of think, oh, actually, I can trust this guy because he's not. Yeah selling whereas my dad is just like bam bam bang can bamboozle people <laughs> and before they know it they're walking out the door with a 500 grand car he's yeah. brilliant right mm. got it um do you know much about um the hartley family yes yeah so carl's become a friend of mine since i interviewed him on the podcast would you regard them as competition uh they they're probably one of the closest uh, dealerships to what we do in terms of how we operate they're a family business like us uh father and son and you know they've got a great business you know they've they are similar to us in ways but we have our own way of doing things they have their own way of doing things we have different clients some crossover but um but look i respect them a lot i think i think they've they've got a great business and a, a name that's very well very well known um but you know we do things our, our own way and you know, we don't try to 
on each other's toes mm. very much at all. Would you see yourself as a competitive kind of person? Like, do you like competition? Does it inspire you or, or not? It does inspire me. Um, you know, I don't, yeah, one of my drives and motivation is to be the best, um, to be the best dealership. You know, it's, it's not to make the most amount of money. It's all about having the best operation, having the best premises, having, uh, you know, it's more about the client and them, their perception. Um, but yeah, in terms of sort of do, do other dealers kind of get under my skin? No, they don't. I, I, I think this market is big enough for lots of different players. Um, and we'll have our little niche and they'll have their, their own little niche. Um, but yeah, you know, on a daily, daily basis, there's, there's cars that you really want. And you mm. really don't want to lose them. Uh, and sometimes you do, obviously, and it ends up on their Hartley's site or someone else's yeah. site. And you're like, damn, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> lost that one, but we'll get the next one. Yeah. So um, I've got a Ferrari Testarossa. Uh, if, if I um, gave that to you, what do you, th what do you think? It's about 15,000 miles. What, do you, what, would you, what could you give to me for that? <laughs> My knowledge of all the cars, every, every said. time I come to, like every time I go to cars, I end up mm -hmm. buying a car. And okay. I said to myself, well, why don't I today. come back and sell one this <laughs> yeah. time? I'd rather buy the RSQ8, I think. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know what, as I said, my, my knowledge on older cars is not great. I would assume, roughly, that car must be 125 grand, is it something like that? I'm, we don't really deal in them, so no. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not kind of like actively buying them or underwriting them. So I, I don't know, I could be wrong, but uh, it seems like a 125 grand car to me, maybe yeah. 150. Mm. Okay. Um, Harry asked me, Harry's our um, producer, um, he said, you need to ask Tom to rate your cars. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to do it. So just out of 10. So Lamborghini Aventador, 2015, 20, 15,000 miles, grey, rate, rate, rate that out of 10. Um, it's got to be a solid eight. Right. I mean, I love the Aventador. I'm a yeah. big Lamborghini fan as well. So, you know, I, I think that car has got so much presence. Um, you know, it's, it's, I guess if I had to rate it to get the 10, it'd want to be 500 miles yeah, and maybe, yeah. maybe not gray. I don't know. I'd, I'd prefer it black or maybe orange or, or something. Do you not think though that these oranges and greens and yellows, a Lamborghini Aventador is already enough of a statement? Yeah. Yeah. I get yeah. that. I get the appeal of a gray one for yeah. sure. Um, I, I personally would probably have a black one, yeah. but so yeah, to get the 10. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll take an eight. Yeah. 1989, nine, I think, it, is it the 993? Anyway, 911 Turbo. The, with the, What's that? Is that the, the 993? Yeah, I think it's 993. Yeah. It's done 80,000 miles. It's the, um, it's the, what do they call it? Guards Red? Guards Red, yeah, yeah. The Fu yeah. Is it the Fuchs? Is that how they call it? The yeah, alloys? the Fuchs alloys, yeah. Yeah, yeah how would you rate that? Yeah, out? I mean, without seeing I'm it, it's, it's hard. Here, right? I mean, <laughs> It's, uh, it's got to be, it's got to be a seven. I mean, 80,000 miles is quite high, yeah. I guess. Maybe it's a six, oh, but wow. I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't, no, I it's good. Maybe it's if good. I saw it, it would, it would go up, but yeah, um, yeah on the All surface. Right, um, 5,000 miles, Air Atom 3, I think it's 3.5, is it? Mm -hmm. How do you rate that out of 10? For, for fun, that's got to be a nine or a 10. Yeah. Um, again, I don't know the full spec, but they are, the most amount of fun you can have in a car, I think, for that yeah. for that money. Um, you know, we, we've got our track day in a couple of weeks, and we're desperate to take the aerial yeah. we've got over there. There's nothing like them yeah. on the track. Right. Yeah. Although someone did actually put one in a barrier in one of our track days. Oh, oh no, it was a catering. Was they, a catering. To spin them is so easy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah you need the runoff thing. areas on the track. Don't yeah. You? Yeah. Goodwood is, is can be a bit bit yeah. hairy. All right, so yesterday I bought my wife an RSQ8, paid one one hundred and eleven for it, five thousand miles. Right that. Yeah, I think RSQ8 is is a great SUV, and especially if you want if you want something a little bit more understated, I think it's a ten. It's 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 the best car that's, you know, you know it's based. Well, the Lamborghini Urus is based on it. Um, that's what my dad's wife drives. She absolutely loves it. Um, so yeah, that I think is one of the best SUVs you can buy for a hundred grand ish. Yeah. Okay. Highlight to yellow, Aston Martin DBS, <laughs> 145 grand, 20,000 miles. 
I mean, highlighter yellow, is, yeah, is that a real can... colour? <laughs> well, no, it's not no. the official term. It's just okay. what, when I sent it to Yanni's to be wrapped, he just called, he called it the highlighter colour. Okay. So he's obviously taking the piss out of me. Um, I mean, if I was offered that car to buy, yeah, I'd probably be rating it a, a five <laughs> <laughs> on the colour. But then again, I, I but think that's why it's so cheap, though. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Yeah. If you bought it at the right money, then it, then it becomes a ten. Yeah. Um, but in terms of how easy that car is to sell compared to a, a dark grey one, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, it looked, like you're, dark it looked like you're paying one fifty-five, maybe even one sixty in a Aston dealer yeah. for a similar car. Yeah, and, and I think unique is, is good. You know, I think, you know, if there's only one yellow one on the whole market and there's 99 people that don't want a yellow one, but there's one person that want a yellow one. They're going to pay top they're money. They're going to pay good yeah. money for it. So it's, it's, it's yeah, it's all yeah. about the supply and the demand. And yeah, as much as most people want a grey one, everyone wants a grey one and there's 19 grey ones for sale. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's sort of horses for courses, really. Yeah. All right, thanks. <laughs> So, um, quick fire round now. So we do okay. a quick fire round on the show. Um, can you mix family and business? <laughs> <laughs> you certainly can, because I'm, I'm doing it. It's got its challenges. Like? Um, you know, me and my dad work pretty well together because we're quite different. Um, you know, he, he's, he's a bit more sort of manic. I'm a little bit more laid back. And it's so we don't, clash that much but you know there are going to be times and he to be fair has taken quite a lot of a step back in the business so he he trusts me he he allows me to put my own you know print on things so very rarely it becomes an issue but you know I can imagine if we were both here a hundred percent of the time it, it would be much more difficult but it can be done it definitely can be done yeah. and I think when you're because a lot of people, people say you shouldn't mix family and business don't they yeah, I mean, I, I think it, you know, being a family member of this business, you're more driven by it. You know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I came into the business with not, I didn't own a share of it, um, but I was hugely driven uh, because it was my family business. And I don't think... So you want to prove yourself even more? Yeah, maybe. you want to yeah. prove yourself, you want to help. You know, when I first you don't started want here, to say, oh, well, it's just yeah, a exactly. Owner. Yeah, you yeah. really, yeah, you've got to prove yourself not yeah. just to my dad. You had to prove yourself to the rest of the staff. Yeah. Um, you know, even the clients. Yeah. You know, and and you have to build your own reputation, and you know, it's, it takes some years at the beginning. Yeah, you do just get sort of oh, yeah, that's the son, that's the son of the owner. Yeah. But you know, you build respect and you build you know momentum in your role, and you know, eventually you get the respect yeah. and you, you get, you know, especially from my dad, I think he, he's been able to take a step back on the basis that he's, he's seen what I've brought to the table. Yeah. What's the most crazy part X you can remember you ever had? Either way, where maybe someone wanted to trade in a VW Golf for a Bugatti or a Bugatti for a VW Golf. <laughs> I mean, we, we, get, we get people looking to part exchange lawnmowers for Bugattis. Really? But, they're really? obviously time wasters. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean, the, the Bugattis out of any of them attract. So you get attract, people taking the piss. You get yeah, the Bart you, you, Simpson you type get, Yeah, you get <laughs> a lot of that. And Bugattis seems to attract them more than anything. So you get all sorts of stupid stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the genuine ones, I, d I don't know. You, you get some really weird, like, customised cars. Um, and you, you get cars that are a million miles away that, you know, it's like a normal, like, I've got a Ford... Focus, but I'm in Indonesia. Can I part exit for, you know, a, a BMW M4 or something? We're just like, really, like, can we really be asked yeah. to do? Yeah. <laughs> like that deal sounds so complicated. Yeah. Um, and you know, surely you can buy one in Indonesia. Yeah. No? But yeah, so we get there's a lot of poor quality inquiries. Right. We'll say, but yeah, we we always want to take stuff that we can we can sell again. Yeah. Uh, ourselves. Yeah. Can money buy happiness? I think it can, but it's, you know, it depends totally on the person, you know, it, it can't, if you're unhappy in life, money's probably not going to make you happy. But I think if you're happy in life, money can make you more happy. Um, you know, it, it does sometimes looking at these cars give you a nice little tickle, a nice little buzz, like a, I like mean, a childhood dream come true almost. I mean, the, the product here is, is amazing. So when you, 
you know, you think of all the different places you could work in, in life. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing else I'd rather be surrounded by. Um, so in that respect, I'm happy working here because mm. I think the product is next level. Um, does, if I made a million tomorrow or I made a hundred grand tomorrow, would that make much effect on my happiness? For like a minute, probably. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I think it's about finding happiness within yourself before money becomes part of the equation. Yeah. What's your biggest mistake? Biggest mistake? Uh, there's nothing that really springs to mind that I've been like, oh my God, do I remember when I made that huge fuck up? Uh, <laughs> there's lots of little ones. Um, for me, it's all about not making the same, same mistake twice. Um, what about the biggest car mistake, the worst trade or? Biggest car mistake. Did you have to I go mean, groveling to dad ever because you're like, dad, I just there's, lost there's, 50. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one yesterday actually, uh, I, I bought an M4 CSL about five months ago now. We'd actually sold three. And then I was like, right, I'm gonna buy another one. Gave 10 grand over list for it. We just sold it for 20 grand under list, I think. So that was a 30 grand loss or yeah. something like that. So that was pretty painful, but you, you take the rough with the smooth, yeah. you know, there's, there's, there's always going to be, and we always say, put it down to experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest regret. Biggest regret. I mean, sometimes I regret not coming into the business before because I went to university, I traveled quite a bit and I kind of didn't really have my business head on until I was probably 25 ish. So I sometimes regret, going to uni, I feel like I could be further along in life. I could be, have more relationships. I could have better knowledge. But then I look back, I did have a lot of fun. So I'm kind of like, I made great friends. I saw the world. So I, it's not really a regret, but in terms of my business and mm. my career, that is probably, I could have got into it a lot earlier and I'd probably be further ahead. Mm. Most brutal life lesson. Brutal life lesson. Um, I don't know if I've had any brutal life lessons, but you know, there's life lessons everywhere around me. You know, there's, I've learned so much from being here. Um, you know, learning how to deal with people, staff. You know, there's people that have left that I really didn't want to leave here, and I learn how going forward. You know, to 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 treat your staff. And to grow your staff and, and, and see things from their perspective, um, you know, and it's not all work, 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 work. It has to be, you know, they're a person just like myself and they need to be constantly encouraged and constantly, you know, uh, growth. The growth of a person, I think, is, is what I've learned um, is imperative to keep great staff. Mm. Mm. What are you, A, most excited about, and B, most scared of for the future? I'm definitely scared of AI. Oh, we were just <laughs> talking about that. I watched yeah. this documentary mm. on AI robots, and oh my God. Oh my God. It's, it's like, terrifying. We are this close. I mean, there's, sorry I jumped in, this is your mm -hmm. question, but um, we are this close to giving autonomy to AI, i.e. Mm. they can make the kill decision. Yeah, it, it, this is, is, yeah. And surely, I think I might have seen that. Is that not Par Pandora's box? Yeah. Like, the, the genie's out of the bottle, that's it. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're just, they're going to be ahead of us as a race. Yeah. yeah. Why, we, we would be inferior. Why yeah. would we be necessary? We would just be a, a consumption good, like the Matrix. Yeah, yeah. They could just end us yeah. instantly. Just use us for it's, our It's, it's pretty scary, and it's, you know, it needs to be managed massively by, I don't know, the government, the yeah. The techies, you know, it's, it's yeah. Well, it's it's a, it, tech, it seems the techies involved don't take responsibility. Mm. They're like, well, our job is to just do the tech. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's quite a few movies, isn't there, where they sort of take over and it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's becoming We're more and more possible. We're predicting our own annihilation. Yeah. And the other thing that was a bit scary was, I think I listened to a, a podcast with Elon Musk and, and Joe Rogan where they talked about these microchips where they can implant microchips which can affect your emotions and affect your abilities and you know that's not too far out either and that's that's kind of scary because it's going to alter you know 
genetics and alter perception so much that you won't know what's real and what's not anymore. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a bit scary. Yeah. Okay, so what's exciting? <laughs> what's exciting? I don't know, life, <laughs> life in general. Um, you know, it's, you know I'm, I'm a fairly new dad, so building uh, my family is massively exciting to me. Um, you know, in terms of this business and this industry, you know, it's, there's only so much I think in this business I want to grow. I think it's now we've become a size where I don't want, really want to get any bigger. Um, just want to get better. You know, it's already quite a lot having 100 cars in stock compared to 50 what we used to have. Um, so, but I'm excited. I'm excited for, you know, what comes next. I mean, you know, I don't know what happens next, but you know, it's just the, the endless sort of uh, rat race of just making things happen and, and building, keep building momentum and, and, and just becoming a better, a better operator. So final question, this show is called Disruptors. What does the word disruptive mean to you? The word disruptors, I guess it's someone or something that comes in to an industry and does something different, which forces the industry to change and to do things differently. If you can come, in, if you can come into this industry and show there's a better way of doing things and everyone else starts doing it, you've disrupted the industry. And where should we follow Romans? international where do you want people to so do you do social yourself I, I do a lot of the social myself yeah i i kind of that was one of the first things i did when i started was was build our our social presence and instagram is probably our biggest at romans international um we're quite active on twitter at romans cars we've got facebook we've got TikTok, uh we've got linkedin but youtube is 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 a big one for us um i do a lot of videos where i present and give quite a lot of information across, which, which a lot of the clients like. Um, I need to do more videos, it's just finding the time. Uh, but yeah, YouTube's a, a good one to find us for sure. Well, it's been amazing to be sat in the middle of a hundred hunks of sexy metal, Tom. <laughs> so thanks for taking yeah. time out of your day to have us Pleasure. Thanks for coming. Show. Appreciate it. Cheers. So let me know in the comments what you thought. Before you go, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel and turn the notification bell on so you do not miss world-class content with world-class entrepreneurs. And remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.